Free money. What? You can't do that. But what if you can? It all began with Silvio Gisel, a German businessman and social reformer born in 1862. Despite once being placed in the pantheon of great economic thinkers, Gisel is largely forgotten today, but his theory of free money was for a time highly influential. Now what is free money anyway? It refers to money being liberated, not that it's given out for free. Although, as we'll see, that can happen too. Gisel was born in the midst of industrialization and the burgeoning socialist movement in response. Becoming a businessman himself, Gisel became disillusioned by the pattern of economic crises around him. Like many others in his day, Gisel wanted to abolish what he saw as exploitation and unearned income, namely interest and rent. But here, he rejected the popular theories of contemporaries like Karl Marx. Rather than private ownership over the means of production, for Gisel, the problem was in the monetary system. Free money, which is just one aspect of a whole system of free economy, sought to be the answer to exploitation under capitalism, while also rejecting collective property or a centrally planned economy, as this was all antithetical to Gisel's ideals of personal freedom. Essentially, he wanted a market system without capitalism. The root of the problem was money, as according to Gazelle, relying on this one instrument as both a medium of exchange and as a store of value was a contradiction. To be a medium of exchange, money performs its function when it changes hands and as a store of value when it doesn't move. Money facilitates trade, but it also facilitates power, being used to dominate the market. His argument was essentially that money made negotiations unfair. Take barter between two producers. They both seek to sell their goods and are under pressure to do so. Food rots, metals rust. The value generally goes down for most goods. Same with human labor. You can sell your labor power, but you can't hoard it. But if one person is trading money, the producer is under that pressure to sell, while the buyer isn't. Money can be put into use at practically any time or place. In fact, if the buyer knows that the price is going to keep falling, they may be incentivized to wait, and the more demand goes down, the more the price goes down. Put simply, commodities are subject to decay, but money is imperishable. It can be hoarded at negligible cost. In a sense, the money owner is actually paid to not hoard it through additional interest, allowing money to circulate. But Gazelle asks, what if money had a carrying cost, a demurge? What if banknotes could rust? In Gazelle's day, this could be implemented with stamp script, a type of currency where every month you must apply a stamp to keep the money valid. The stamp would cost a percentage of the face value of the bill, thus losing value. Money would have to circulate, because otherwise it would rot away. As for the other type of unearned income, rent on land and resources, Gazelle was similar to Georgism, and you could take your pick for videos on that. As land is given by nature, Gazelle thought it should belong to everyone, but it could be leased out. Those who currently own land, since they purchased it, would be compensated for their purchase. Like Georgism, Gazelle's ideas initially appealed to a wide array of people across the political spectrum for its many different applications. On one hand, Gazelle personally leaned into the anarchist camp. His ideal system might be best described as a union of individuals, as drawn from Max Stirner. On the other hand, his ideas could also appeal to those who wanted a strong state. He appealed to socialists who wanted to replace the system, and capitalists who wanted to strengthen the system. At the same time, Gazelle seemed like an alternative beyond both capitalism and communism alike. As for the rest of society, Gazelle incorporated many of the popular social theories of the time. For example, he argued since mothers birthing children increased the demand for land, income from rent should be used to pay mothers. This might ensure they're more financially independent as well, thus allowing them to choose partners outside of economic necessity. Globally, he was against nationalism. He advised a voluntary confederacy of European states. His future was a world of free-flowing trade. So, has anyone tried this? Well, Gazelle himself offered his services during the German Revolution, becoming a people's commissar in the government of the Bavarian Soviet Republic in 1919. He began implementing his plan until about a week later when the government was overthrown and Gazelle spent the next few months in prison. He would continue to promote his ideas until his death in 1930. As it turns out, right around this time was the Great Depression, a turbulent time for world finance, and thus there was new interest in experimental measures. Famous economists of the period began to take notice. 
Irving Fisher, for example, endorsed Gazelle's money idea, even if he didn't accept the overall theory. While John Maynard Keynes praised Gazelle and built off similar ideas. In this desperate environment, a handful of towns at first, mostly around southern Germany, were willing to try the idea. And so, some Gazelle supporters created the Vira, a currency that depreciated by 1% every month and which could be exchanged for Reichsmarks. In the mining town of Schwedenkirchen, the closed town mine was bought by an engineer named Max Hebeker, who decided to try out the currency and ask the unemployed townspeople if they'd be willing to work for it. Seeing the miners being paid in the currency and spending it, the local businesses soon took notice and started accepting it too. Soon, in the midst of the world's worst economic depression, this small town began to have an economic boom which carried over into the entire region. That is, until 1931, when the German government decided to crack down on the Vira as an unauthorized currency. This caused the experiment to abruptly end. Habecker attempted to keep the business afloat but was forced to downsize. Unemployment soon surged once more. Then there was the small alpine town of Vorgel, Austria, with its population of a few thousand people at the onset of the depression. Almost all of the town's workers were unemployed, and revenue was negligible. In 1932, the town agreed to take relief money paid by the government and use it to back depreciating work certificates based on Gazelle's stamp system. By the end of the year, unemployment dropped by 25%, and the economy boomed. The town now had money to pay people, and they embarked on major infrastructure projects paid with free money. But here again, the national government became alarmed by the rival currency and decided to ban it. The Great Depression saw many such experiments, some based on gazelle and some not, although they mostly all had similar ends. There was the Canadian social credit system, based on the theories of C.H. Douglas, and in the United States, some towns strangely tried to reverse Vorgel, where people had to buy stamps to spend money instead of to save it, causing the exact opposite effects. People were encouraged to hoard their money or to take it outside the formal economy, only harming it further. For one last example, let's look at something more modern. In the small town of Shemuratovo in Bashkurtistan, the town's declining agricultural enterprise implemented a depreciating currency in 2010 in the wake of the Great Recession. Prior to the experiment, the company was mostly out of money. Wages had to be delayed for months, and people were given food in debt from the company's grocery stores to survive. So the business decided to print new money. Like previous examples, a portion of salaries were paid in script to introduce it. Until the government called this a violation of the labor laws and shut this down. But they tried again, this time by selling the script like gift cards. People would be paid their full salaries in rubles, but then could buy the new currency in the company stores, and then buy goods with it. Overall, the experiment caused commodity turnover to increase dramatically. Productivity increased, arrears were paid off, and salaries increased. The surrounding region took notice, and other businesses started to accept the currency. Whether from the experiment or from the business climate improving in general, there was an improved well-being among townspeople. Here, the goal of saving the business was achieved, and the economy was stabilized. But again, the government tried to stop the experiment multiple times, leading to its retirement after a few years. Given these successes, why didn't Gazelle catch on further? First, we have to acknowledge that these were relatively short and local experiments, and it's uncertain how they would apply on a large scale. Blanc has argued that the experiments relied heavily on trust, both a distrust in the value of conventional money and trust among a local community to implement. Hence why the experiments worked in small towns, but that doesn't necessarily translate to a whole country. The experiments also don't necessarily validate the free economy as a whole. Only the depreciating currency idea was really tried. The actual theory and other dimensions of Gazelle's thought fell by the wayside. As we saw, the main limiting factor was that such theories are often testable on the local level, but national governments aren't inclined to cede their power over monetary policy and kill the initiatives in the cradle. The theory's chameleon nature also divided the movement and made it hard to fit into the political landscape. It came about in a difficult time just before World War II, which would largely destroy any momentum the movement had. Then in the post-war, the world was primed by the Cold War towards certain norms, leading such eccentric theories behind. More popular economists, like Keynes, who came from the victorious side of the war, overshadowed Gazelle on the world stage. Some scholars, like Guido Preparati, have gone so far as to say Keynes stole Gazelle's ideas and then de-radicalized them to aid the existing capitalist order. But in either case, the recovery of the world economy after the war took the wind out of the sails of Gazelle. Even still, the theory has not been completely forgotten. 
In the face of our contemporary economic obstacles, Gazelle's theories have been proposed as a way of moving toward greener economies and stimulating community infrastructure. As money continues to be printed year after year, and humanity faces problems like economic inequality, environmental destruction, and more, we may just hear from Gazelle again.